It's our community, and I am so delighted you're here. We have a really interesting guest today because he does something that, well, first of all, I can't do. I wouldn't know how to begin. And he does something different than anybody that I've ever met. He's a cartoonist. That in and of itself is not the thing. He sells cartoons to the New Yorker. His name is Tom Toro. And I say welcome, and it's nice to introduce you to all of our neighbors, because it is, you know, our community. So when we start out here, um, being a successful cartoonist is not the easiest thing in the world to decide to do. Yes? No? Correct. Correct. Yeah. And you had, uh, what did you tell me, 610 tries before you got a yes. That's right. I, yeah, I had submitted 610 different ideas to the New Yorker over the course of, I think it was over the course of about two and a half, three years, starting in 2007 up through 2010. That's a long and time between meals. It is a long time. <laughs> it is a long time between meals. Uh, the only reason I was able to do it is because I was actually living at home at the time with my parents. Um, I'd gone through a tough period in my mid-20s, was directionless, and moved back home, which is in the Bay Area, the same house where I spent my childhood. My parents lived in the same house for 30 years, so it was funny to return back. And they took you back. And they took me back. <laughs> so yeah. Um, and when I, when I was there, I then began, I sort of returned to a very early love of mine, which was drawing cartoons. I, when I was a kid, I remember I, the first thing they had in my mind about what I wanted to do with my life as an adult, the way I, you know, whatever you imagine as a child that means is to be a Disney animator. You know, I, would, I would watch those Disney films back uh -huh, and forth, uh -huh. and this was a time of VHS tapes, so I would pause the VHSs at my favorite scenes and copy down the scenes. Um, so I don't that was sort of maybe subconsciously in my mind as I was figuring out what mm -hmm. new direction in my mid-20s for my life to take, but I started cartooning again, and for whatever reason, I immediately fixated on Mount Everest. You know, I was going to get into the New Yorker. <laughs> well, <laughs> Probably because it was the most There's nothing prominent. like starting at the top. But, right, yeah, yeah, shoot the moon. Um, but 610 no's would discourage most people. Yeah, I think what kept me going was not only s stubbornness. I'm a very stubborn person, which as, as an artist well, you, you kind be. of have to be, or mm -hmm. in any profession, and really. And th thick-skinned as well. Yes, yeah. So it's almost, you know, it's, it's, it's a way of not only breaking in, but also in a way training yourself for what you need to be able to endure even after you've broken in. Because there are still stretches of rejection. You go on dry periods. I'll go for, you know, three, four months without selling a cartoon and you start to, self-doubt starts to creep in and you question yourself, but then you make another sale and you keep going. So in just a way... Just often enough to keep you interested. Just often enough to, yeah. <laughs> it's, yeah well, they tell keep, me, they keep tell me, me why in. January the 20th, 20 th 2010 was an important date. Yeah, you mentioned that day before. That's, that's seared in my mind. Uh, that was when I checked my email one afternoon. This is a very modern success story. I checked my email and it changed my life. I got a sale from the New Yorker. Um, it was just a simple subject line, cartoon sold, from the assistant at the time, letting me know that my first cartoon, um, which was one about a bow-legged cowboy, which maybe we can show, but there's a saloon scene, there's two cowboys sitting at the bar. I don't have that one. I, I, can, I can get it to you. Okay. And then there, behind them, there's the saloon doors, you know, the classic swinging saloon doors. You see a cowboy's head above, but there's nothing below the doors. Mm -hmm. And they're saying, that's one bow-legged cowboy, because his legs go outside the span of the door frame. Um, and that's, that's the one I sold. Um, and the thing about breaking in, too, is in the beginning, you have to prove to them that you can deliver material that they can publish, you know, that, yeah. they, that they think is good enough to publish. So it, was, it doesn't, wasn't just 610 ideas. It was fully-fledged cartoons. You know, you yeah. have to paint them and do the final inking and everything. So you're submitting that's, finishes. But that's a lot of which work. Which takes a lot of work. Yeah. But it's also training. You know, because yeah. to be honest, you know, the 610 weren't undiscovered masterpieces. There was a lot that weren't good, and it was yeah. just a process of teaching, you know, well, myself. Well, that's right. Yeah. But, and you picked The New Yorker, but it would occur to me that different publications look for different style, different conversation, you know, I don't know. Is right. that the case? Or? There are tonal differences, certainly, between different publications. Um, I think the reason why The New Yorker appealed to me is because it was... 
I mean, it, you know, it's the it's the best. It's the best of the best. And there, there's sort of something very noble about their cartoons. Yes. Like like you're you're amid. You know, there there there's you get a thrill out of being amid this wonderful journalism and this very elegant magazine. That's right. You and can yet say, here, I submit to the New Yorker. Yeah. Yes. I mean, why do you have me on the show? Because I'm a New yeah. Yorker. And it's like you know that's yeah. it's very it's prestigious, and so it's a good you know target to aim for. And it kind of was in line with just my natural kind of you know wry erudite sense of humor. Um, yeah. You know, I'm. I'm I, I read voraciously, and I'm interested in all, all these kind of subjects, and I am kind of the New Yorker's target readership, the sort of, you know, yuppie, liberal intellectual, so I, yeah. I, I can fit into their milieu yeah. fairly easily. Um, you know, I just use the word milieu, so, like, I can fit into the New Yorker. Yeah, that's right. But well, like, yeah. but different, <laughs> different magazines uh, and publications of one sort or another, you know, depending on what their readership is, right. they wouldn't get some of your... Cartoons. No, you tailor, yeah, you definitely yeah. tailor jokes. And you have yeah. to piece it together by, but you know, The New Yorker alone isn't enough to have a career. It's prestigious. It's a good feather in your cap. Do you sell to other publications? Yeah, uh -huh. yeah. And I think also the other reason why The New Yorker was, was a target at the time is because at the moment at which I started trying to pursue gag cartooning as a profession, magazine cartooning as a profession, fewer and fewer magazines were actually featuring cartoons. And The New Yorker was one of the last places. But how do you know if it's funny or not? It may be funny to you, and I. We're going to look at a That's couple. That's the only criterion you can go by. You can't. Yeah. Whenever I mean, you try and make a cartoon, we'll look trying at to tailor we'll it look to at the a couple editor's of those. taste. I mean, I looked at some. Yeah. I, said, I don't think that's funny. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's a joke. So. There's a joke that the New Yorker is not supposed to. No, that the New Yorker cartoons aren't actually funny, which I don't agree with. But there, there's, can we ca say there's kind of humorous. Humorous, smart. Yeah. Well, actually, it's funny when you look at the contract the New Yorker mm -hmm. sends you when you become a freelance cartoonist for them. Um, which, there's no there's no staff position. I'm not I'm not like on staff with them. It's all freelance. But the, nowhere in the contract do the words cartoon, gag or gag or joke appear. You're paid to send them idea drawings. They're called idea, idea drawings. drawings. Oh, that's it. Which I think gives them the most latitude in terms of so what they can the publish. So you're in the light bulb business. Right, exactly. <laughs> and I've made several that actually deal with you know light bulbs. <laughs> yeah. um, Does the style of your work? have anything, the style of your drawing, have anything to do with the ability to sell, or do you change that style according to the publication that you're... I would say any, I would say that it just, it comes naturally based on after a certain period of time, you, you take note of what gets okayed and what doesn't get okayed, so you sort of naturally tailor the jokes and the subject matter to what you anticipate the editors might like. And you also do the natural thing, too, of paying attention to what holidays are coming up, seasonal jokes and that kind of thing. How about the way you dress your characters? Clothing is one of the hardest. It's, it's hard. I'm not, I'm not a sartorial person by nature. Dressing my characters is extremely difficult. I think all my guys just wear button downs and my women wear... No matter what publication. Well, you know... I was I was when I was, when I started selling to them I was living in California. Uh -huh. So I would have to pay attention to the calendar and then when from November through March I would have to intentionally put scarves on my characters uh -huh. and put them in jackets cuz you know the weather out in the but bay nice area was clothes. fine. But I would have to I would have We're to We're not like, talking about frumpy looking people. No, you try you try and be as fat relatively yeah. fashionable. Yeah. You don't you also don't want to draw attention to it. You know like in creating a gag cartoon it's very important to be clear about what the intent of the joke is and then not to include anything in the drawing that is extraneous or distracting, you know. So if your joke is about just two people sitting on a couch making some funny observation, you're not going to put them in like flashy clothes or it mm -hmm. has to be I would say the probably the dominant the dominant sort of um, tone of the New Yorker cartoons is that they they feel natural. It's not goofy. Like it's not. It's not no, forced it's not in goofy. a way, right? No, it is not. So they're meant to sort of be ripped from our world. You do know? do some publications want goofy? Newspaper cartoons, I think, would tend more toward that. Yeah. Sort of goosing the gag a little bit. Yeah. And that's what I was actually doing with some of my earlier stuff. So, I was just submitting by mail between 2007 and 2009, the old-fashioned way. I'd, I'd print them out, send in an envelope by mail, get a rejection back <laughs> with the cut-out form rejection, yeah. just and you know, hammer that to my wall. And then I finally, in 2009, went out to flew out to New York intentionally to go to see the editor Bob Mankoff, who's since retired, but he was the editor at the time. And that was one of the notes that he gave me was that you know I was drawing my characters in a way that was too intentionally funny, you know, like I was ah. I was I was trying to force the humor a little bit. I see. And so I took that away um, well, as the main note to try and adjust to. There are two components to the to your cartoons. One is the are the one component are the is the figure or figures. Mm -hmm. The other is the uh, verbiage that you put in. Right. 
So what is the most important getting the point across? The writing. Okay. Yeah, the writing. So For me, it starts with the writing. Sometimes okay. you can create a cartoon that has no words, and that's sort of the cartoon ideal. You know, yeah. if, you can, if you can do it, it's the platonic yeah. ideal of the cartoon, if yeah. you can convey the joke just visually. But a lot of the times you have to rely on a caption. Yeah. Okay. How do you think up the captions? That would just, I, I would think, I, I can't think of a thing that's funny today. I'm sorry. <laughs> that's the starting point. I mean, the starting point is really you sit down and just, I would say probably what, differentiates a professional cartoonist from an amateur cartoonist is the willingness to endure dry the, the dry spells <laughs> and the, the boredom of like I don't have anything and just instead of reaching for your phone instead of looking for a distraction you just sort of sit in it but do you and let your mind the wander. newspapers do you read yeah, does that for sure. give you something funny yeah. to say the, usually the ones that appear in the magazine itself aren't topical so y it's good to stay abreast of current events but you, they're not going to usually buy one for publication that is ripped from the headlines because they don't. They want their journalism to do the journalism. They don't want the cartoons to do but that. But in reading things, you also read about people and they right. what they say and what they do. And it seems to me that that sometimes yeah. It I mean, is you have funny. to you have to be up on like social media trends. You know, there's a lot of stuff. Since Bob retired, the new editor Emma Allen is I think 29 years old, and she's also the first female editor of the New Yorker wow. cartoons. Um, is her taste different? It is more contemporary. Yeah, I mean, it is younger. You definitely get that sense. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, you have to know what a hashtag is. You know, you you, ha you just have to stay up on these things um, in order to be able to joke about it. So yeah. there are others. There, are, there, the numbers get larger that I don't understand. That are not funny. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, but they still buy the classic ones. You know, the therapist couch will always be a trope that is returned yeah. to the desert <laughs> island. True. You know. <laughs> that that is true. And you have to be aware of the tradition that you're in too, because one of the things the New Yorker does is they they'll never repeat a joke. So you might think you've come up with a new desert island joke. Someone might have done it two decades before. So you really have to school yourself in Do they keep a file? Oh yeah. Yeah. So the process is oh. the editor gets all the submissions on Tuesday now it is. That number is about a thousand probably. Individual cartoons from the assorted cartoonists. Mm -hmm. Of those, she will winnow it down to 35. She'll take those 35 into the head editor, David Remnick, who then he is the one that makes the final okays in consultation with Emma. Um, so then you'll have 15 to 20 that they want to buy, down from 1,000. Then she hands it to her assistant, and they research and look for similars. So they'll research back in their own archives. They'll research other magazines. They'll really? Google search newspaper <laughs> cartoons, and if anything looks too close to that gag, then they'll kill it. So you can get oh. all the way in that process, and then there's someone else who did it in 1995, 1974. So you have to, part of the job is being aware of what's been done before, the kind of tradition that you stand in and what other people are doing. Well, if they buy 15 cartoons a week, do they publish them all? They'll hold on to them for a while. Oh, I think the record is a James Stevenson cartoon that was bought and then... 12 or 15 years later was published. And that's why mm -hmm. going topical is not necessarily to your benefit because the ones that they'll buy that they're going to publish the next week are very rare. Usually they hold on to them. They have about six that they haven't published of mine yet, some of which I sold back in 2014. So, so you, you never know when they'll appear. Surprise. Yeah, you never know when they'll appear. <laughs> well, let's, I think we ought to look at some of the cartoons. And sure. we'll, they'll, we'll pull up a couple that I didn't think were funny. And you can, you oh, can tell me that I'm out of date. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> this is one of them. Um, I looked at this, and they, the fellows are much younger than I that are up there in the booth, and they thought that was hysterically funny. I said, I don't think it's funny. I said, I think that's aggravating. I said, the when somebody this, hits a the, reply, the cameraman's all. cracking up. Yeah. So, yeah. I said, when they hit the reply all, I don't really care about their reply, but I, <laughs> my, my email is cluttered with reply all. So I'm annoyed, and I don't think that's funny at all. Right. So? Well, the joke is just premised on the, you know, the embarrassing reply all, where you meant to just address the sender, and you said oh, something yeah. embarrassing about the other people who were included on the thread. See, I just thought about the annoying yeah. clogging up my email. And also, I think, I think it also rests on the absurdity of, so you went to the extent of See, doing the impossible, the which was to build a time machine just to erase yeah. this one embarrassing incident. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You could have gone back and killed Hitler. Instead, you chose to yeah. hit reply instead of reply. <laughs> that, you know? Yes, yes. <laughs> well, okay, let's look at some other. And some of them, I thought were a chuckle, and some of them I thought were. Um, now, see this one. So I that's didn't, that's a topical one. I yeah. know, but I didn't understand it. You see, 
And I said, I don't know what he's talking about. And so they said, well, you haven't seen Ghostbusters. And I said, no. And so you have to have seen Ghostbusters. You have to have seen it. Yeah, yeah. you have to have seen it. They, so. so they they put me in the category of those who got out of the home for some reason to come and <laughs> talk to you. Today. <laughs> <laughs> so that would that would be the topic. That's actually one that I did for. So there's the cartoons that appear in the magazine itself. And, and then there's also ones that appear online. And, and tell me why you have to have seen. What what do you have to know about Ghostbusters to appreciate that cartoon? Um, it was when. I'm gonna not, I'm gonna have to call on help from your staff to get the name of the person who passed away. It was a memorial cartoon. Oh. For the, for oh. one of the actors who had oh, appeared in Ghostbusters. Oh. Uh, oh. Who because okay. I'm under the hot lights I can't remember his name. Okay. But he had died. Ah, so that okay. was a memorial cartoon. Okay. So his ghost See, so is then passing on and he joins the Ghostbusters. But yeah. some of them I do think so. We'll so there's so that one actually appeared on the New Yorker's website. So they'll have oh, the magazine it? cartoons and they'll have the daily cartoons. Which okay. you create for the website, which are yeah, more topical. See, I looked at that and I said, I don't understand what he's talking about. Does anyone does anyone remember his name? No, nobody's come I'll up with anything. Up. But anyway, let's look at another one because some of them are really. And I think, how do you think up all this stuff? I would be. Now, see, I I really I I like that. That one. one's funny, right? Yes, <laughs> that I would. That one I I could yes, I like that. Right, just please take the accordion. Yes. So if you visited my house, that's what you would see. Uh -huh. Sometimes I draw from life, you know, that that the ability to sort of enshrine, you know, our current house, like in the cartoon, and that's our cat in the background. Okay, so that's, that's that's the kind of fun part of yeah. being a cartoonist is you can include those little autobiographies. Well, the little boy uh, will appear pretty soon. Ever since he was born two and a half years ago, I've I've hidden his initials oh, um, have in you? the cartoon. So <laughs> that's yeah. really so keep an eye out. Yeah. That is okay. Let's look at it. There we go. Now see, I saw the Big Lebowski. I did, and it was a fun <laughs> film. <laughs> And then, and then they had to explain to me, and then when they explained it to me, it was, it was, I, it is funny. Yeah. You know. The Big Lebowski is so informative. Yeah. It's such a ubiquitously influential and funny movie that anything you say can, uh -huh. so yeah. yeah. So the joke isn't that he prompted the conversation by mentioning something, it's that, it's that the Big Lebowski no. is constantly running through that other guy's That's mind. That's right. See, so and I think saw about. it, I don't know how many years ago, and right. I haven't thought about it much since, right. so that right. didn't resonate. And I was proud of that one because I hadn't <laughs> seen any other cartoon that had anything. Like, uh -huh. like, like, the, like the concept of uh -huh. this could be anything. Yeah. I was going to just have the, the, the bubble blank or, yeah. or do it some other way, but no, well, that's I better. liked having uh, it. Because it, it gives me a little clue. Right. Yeah. <laughs> right. And it's also a good example of sort of the best cartoons allow you to imprint yourself upon them. Right. So you can right. imagine what might well, have been said. And right? you have done, uh, there's a difference in editorial comment yes, yes. and the funny ones. Right. And you did one, um, this one, now this one, I, I, I thought that was, that was not so funny as it was frightening. Yeah. And uh, That's probably my best known one. Yes, the planet uh, got destroyed. But for a beautiful moment in time, we created a lot of value for shareholders. <laughs> I mean, that, that's yeah. It's dark. Hard yeah. It's stuff. very dark. It's very yes. dark. It the, the, thing that, the thing that makes it an acceptable cartoon is, is going back to the writing of it. So mm -hmm. if you imagine that joke of them saying, yes, the planet got destroyed, but we created a lot of value for shareholders, that's not very funny. It's the sort of poeticism of, but for a beautiful moment in time. And That's it right. sets you up for the, That's right. you know, so he's waxing poetical about, you expect him to say, we created a beautiful culture, we wrote these yeah. books, we painted these paintings, we, you know, no, he's waxing poetical about stock prices, you know, it's and that's, a, yeah. that's yeah. where the joke comes in. And yeah. it, it, I would think that you have to think carefully about the length of your comment yeah. and to get it the... Zoom in on the brevity, point. Brevity, yeah, yeah, brevity for sure. I mean, you yeah. know, if you look through them, there's very, very few jokes that go even to the length of two sentences. Yeah. Usually it's just one sentence. One. Probably George, George Booth had some lengthy, lengthy, you know, yeah. captions that were, yeah. they were hefty, um, but it relied, the joke relied on the repetition of the idea. Well, you did a political comment on Donald Trump. Yeah, I published a book last summer, Tiny Hands, yes. uh, collecting like Trump stuff. Yes, yeah. and... There he is. And I, I've seen that I, other places. I forgot where it was. I saw that. But um, that's been reproduced a yeah. number of times. 
Well, I had the, so the, the Daily Cartoon, which the New Yorker does on their website, is intentionally meant to be more topical mm -hmm. and kind of ripped from the headlines in mm -hmm. a way that the magazine cartoons are not. And I had the kind of dubious distinction of being tapped to do the Daily Cartoon for the New Yorker website at the moment of the inauguration and the two months following. So it was a tricky time because previously, you know, I'd done it two times before, and in those moments it was more of a grab bag. You know, you could do a joke about Obama, you could do a joke about the Oscars, you could do a joke about mm -hmm. whatever else was happening. Mm -hmm. Trump takes up all the oxygen. He so did. every mm -hmm. day it had to be a Trump joke. And mm -hmm. every day he unfortunately supplied us with a new outrage to Lampoon. Yeah. So it was just, I had for so for two and a half months, I was just doing a Trump joke every day. And now that's what's collected. The tricky part is doing a character that, that people right. um, like people, do you want them to like to it? To make it do be recognizable, and it's, it's different than my normal characters. My normal characters, I tend toward a more minimalist uh -huh. depiction of people. But that is not. That's not, no, you have to, be, it has to be recognizable. And luckily he has such a, such a, you know, recognizable face, and there's the waddle and the wrinkles and the orange, the orange is very important. Mm -hmm. When you're doing a cartoon for the website, you can use color, mm -hmm. whereas in the magazines you don't. So you just don't, having it yeah. be a vivid orange helps. Yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, it was also a time, not only for the cartooning was it difficult, but it was a time when there was just so much comedic saturation. Mm -hmm. Everyone, so it had to be yeah, good. Every, you had to be unique, and it was just, there was so much pressure yeah. to get your own unique slant on it. Yeah. So, you know, every time I would have to think, okay, well, what can I do that is particular to the cartoon medium? You know, like, what am I doing in cartoons that, that Alec Baldwin can't do on Saturday Night Live? You know, you have to use the cartoon tools that's right. So, you know, That's right. disobeying physics, having him compared to a bowl of oranges and that kind of thing. So, <laughs> like, just things yeah. that um, things that live in the visual cartoon world instead of late night television or, you know, because so, it, it was just a bombardment. And here's another one. Uh, and I guess that's Bannon sitting in the background, yes? That was when Bannon, was, before he got ousted, yeah. Yeah. And yeah, so that one, there was this moment in time when people were trying to stage a general strike as a protest. I think it was in the late springtime, yeah. in the first blush of the resistance, and um, that was just my way of showing support for it, and also doing a meta cartoon. It's not often the New Yorker will let you do a cartoon that, that is meta, that sort of comments on the structure of the cartoon itself, yeah. but them dropping the banner over the caption. Uh -huh. um, it was, it was a, nod, a nod to that, like, we're going to even put ourselves on pause to support whoever wants to strike yeah. as artists. You know? And see, I, I think in a good cartoon, people can sometimes read into it something that they see that you may or may not have intended, but to them it comes through. Right. So Did you see something in there that I didn't intend? Uh, no. <laughs> well, I, no, I didn't. But I, but I think... Um, I may not have understood why the, the sign was in front, you see, of the... Right. F words or something like that. So it's nice to it's hear cartoon of solidarity sort of thing. Yeah. And yeah. the New Yorker, you know, they're we're trying there there there's an intentional push now. If you go back into the annals of New Yorker cartoons, probably ninety nine percent of the characters are white. Uh huh. And probably eighty five percent of the speaking roles, whoever is saying the caption, mm -hmm. are men. Uh -huh. And so even within the cartoon itself, and there's an intentional push now to diversify. Um, so that's one thing that my, my generation of cartoonists is especially trying to do is include characters of color, include women delivering the punchlines. Mm -hmm. So, um, I, you know, I think that's yeah. it. You know, I have to go back to Pogo. Okay. Pogo uh, is one of my very favorites. And Pogo was in the funnies, as you may recall. But he also made political comments um, through those funnies. So he was a cartoonist. Uh, uh, and, of course, he had four frames to tell the story. Right. But he also was uh, a political cartoonist. He mm. made, uh, I, I, the, one of the most famous things is when Pogo looks out over the swamp and they're fighting a battle of some sort, and he says, I see the enemy and it is us. Mm. And um, Pogo is, is really... I'm not as familiar with that. Uh, I should well, go back and... You go back yeah, and yeah. look at Pogo because... Yeah. Maybe that's just me, but it's just one of my favorites. Right. But it's a yeah, difference. In the newspaper, you can get away with things. Having the sequential storytelling that's right. is much different. That's right. And yeah. the editorial cartoon and the funnies cartoon with right. the forefront and the the regular uh, cartoons, the you got to be funny in 30 words or less right. or whatever it is. Right. I mean, those are all take a little bit of a different mindset. 
Right. Might, it's more might. narrative, you know. It's more narrative yeah. to be able to do that. And I, 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 I have an email acquaintance with Gary Trudeau, who's one of my, uh -huh. you know, idols. Yes. And I mean, he managed to successfully. And you can also create a larger roster of characters, recurring characters. I mean, you're dealing in narrative. You're dealing but in see, storytelling. See, you haven't done that really. You don't. No, I think the only person who actually managed to create a sort of recurring roster of characters on the pages of the New Yorker was Charles Adams with the Adams family. And he was and they good. don't really. It's it's. I don't think anyone of my generation is really trying that or mm -hmm. feels like mm -hmm. we're allowed to, really. Uh, I don't know if we're out of cartoons or not, but there may be another one or two left in our bag to to take a look at. But I. I just think it is so interesting. Now, I see, I thought this was really funny. <laughs> I, I thought that was funny. It says, I don't like large groups. I can never remember what our plural is. <laughs> I, and to see, to me, that was very funny. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. They didn't laugh hysterically over that. But see, I thought that was funny. Yeah, it's a grammar joke. Yeah. You know? <laughs> see, and the grammar jokes appeal to me. So. And again, it works with the subversion of expectation. You know, I don't like large groups. I'm shy. Yeah. No, I just don't like large groups because yeah. I'm annoyed that I can't remember what our, you know, yeah. me, smooth, So mises, when mises. you do, th oh, here's another one. I, I see, I, that appeals to me too because that's <laughs> me standing in the door. And she says, right. can we talk through a decision that I've already made? Yeah, my see, wife didn't appreciate me, me I, doing see, that. See, I, I, I related <laughs> to that, you see. So I, I thought that was, was really fun. I mean, yeah. you, you, Relationship jokes will always be good, good fodder. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, because they're funny. They're, let's see, I worked here uh, for six years before I, um, before I, I can't Before I noticed it, it was hell. Uh, before I noticed it was hell. <laughs> I mean, I, I just think that's kind of funny, too. Yeah. So that's an example of one that I, you know, the, 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 the secret of once you're into The New Yorker, uh -huh. and, or any magazine, really, you can start the slow and subtle process of resubmission. You can take old ideas and refashion them, you know, rewrite the caption, rework, sometimes reworking the drawing, mostly just reworking the captions. And I would say in the past, you know, handful of years, most of the things that I've sold are ones that I've rewritten, you know, just resubmitted with a new caption under well, it. So I submitted that one maybe four or five times. Well, see, but sometimes, well, as you said, it's the caption that sells the it's cartoon. It's the entire thing, yeah. Because you don't have particular characters. Now, like Gary Trudeau has lots of characters that you can relate to one or the other of, right, but right. you don't. So you have to depend on the words right. to, to get them. And for, he, I mean, you know, for, for Doonesbury, for, you know, he was, he was, he was very intentionally chronicling the, the time. You know the Vietnam era and all, all yeah. that was going on. Often, not even so much going for the joke. You know, you know really being incisive and observational. But to me, that moves from a, a joke to a political comment. Yeah, and and that's yeah. okay. And you can do both. Absolutely. You know, ideally, you'd be able to do both. There was a you know there was a um, an interview that John Stewart from the Daily Show gave to mm -hmm. Terry Gross, and she um, called him a journalist. And he didn't want to accept that title. And, but she said, well, you do all this research and fact-checking. And he said, well, the research and the fact-checking that we do is not for journalistic purposes. It's for comedic purposes. For comedic. And here's why, he said. Yeah. Um, jokes don't work unless they're true. That's right. And that rung to me as it immediately became my motto, you know, in, ne in neon right. lights over my And study. they don't work unless they ring true to right. peoples, peoples out right. there, right. the plural, right. peoples. It but has to sort I, of uncover you know, a hypocrisy of some kind or yeah. strip bare a subject. But you know, yeah. I, th our time has gone too fast. It really oh, has. Sure. I enjoyed it. And Thank you for having me. And Tom Toro is, um, he's not a comedian. He's a commentator, <laughs> I think, <laughs> on that, life sure. and the funny side of life and also um, sometimes the political side of something to be considered. And it is such a pleasure to have you. May you live long and sell many cartoons. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for being with us. And thanks, Tom. Thank you. We'll see you soon again. So look for us. We'll be back. It's our community. <laughs>